Good afternoon, afternoon? Yes, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining me. Guys, again, we've had a wild time um, so far on this war from the Ukrainian air war is just ratcheting up. We've got the French elections, we've got the Baltic states talking about going to Ukraine without NATO, thumbs up. All sorts of stuff happening. So I'm going to give you a little bit more of a deep dive into this. I'm going to tell you what it all means. I'm going to give you a lot of my speculation. And I'm going to back this up with the facts and figures and I'll put all the links to various articles I've read in the description if you want to check them up yourself and if you want to give me an alternate perspective I would love that. Guys don't forget to like, comment and subscribe, it really helps me out when you do that. It's just one little touch of your finger on that little thumbs up and it means so much to us. Um, so anyway guys let's jump straight into it. I'll give you these in um, the best chronological order I can although I may be switching back and forwards a little bit but please just stick with me guys and I'll try and tie it all in together. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's come out in the news now that the Ukrainian Air Force may keep some F-16s outside of Ukraine to protect them from Russian airstrikes. Guys, what have I been saying for the longest time? I don't even think any of them are going to go into Ukraine. I just don't see the utility in it. They're going to go to Ukraine. <coughs> There's only a few airfields that they can fly from. As soon as the um, F-16s fly from those airfields, the Russians are going to just blanket bomb that airfield. And then you've got an aircraft then that needs trucking out. And it's hard to truck an aircraft out. So that's the reality of the situation. So now they've come out, and I'll read you what they've said in a second. But now basically they've come out and they're saying, oh, well, maybe we're just going to keep a few outside of Ukraine to protect them. Guys, if they're keeping them outside to protect them, that means that that means one of two things. Either they're not going to be used, so what's the point in giving them them, giving them over to the Ukrainians, or they're going to be flying from another country. And guys, that's absolutely wild. Remember what I keep saying, guys, it's not just the aircraft, it's the parts, it's the servicing, it's the upgrades, it's all that sort of logistic that goes with with that aircraft. I think Poland's going to be the uh, the hub, but you know who knows. So let me just quickly read you the article. <clears throat> Ukrainian air force may keep some F-16 jets abroad to protect them from Russian strikes. Military officers say, "Well, guys, you know what? When you're in a war, that's what happens, all right? You can, you know, you, you're that by keeping these jets in another country, they're bringing that other country into the conflict." Now, that other country, obviously, they're not going to be bullied into it. They will accept this and they will accept this risk. So straight away, and, you know, as, I'm, as we'll read into the articles later, we've got the Baltic states who are ready to go into Ukraine with or without the NATO thumbs up. So I think that's really key. So we've got all these countries now, you know, and that may be the situation. Because if the Baltic states send their troops into Ukraine, they're a target anyway. Why not have the F-16s on their ground? Um... Yeah, Ukraine may keep some of his F-16s. Yeah, Ukraine may keep some of the F-16 fighter jets it is set to receive from its Western allies at foreign bases to protect them from Russian strikes. Again, you know, if they're keeping them in foreign bases, it, it kind of tacitly implies here that they're going to be using flying sorties from foreign bases. Can you imagine the escalation in that, guys, all right? Can, just imagine the escalation from the Russian perspective. You've now got NATO aircraft being flown by, we don't know who, flying from NATO countries, using NATO munitions, attacking targets, enemy, well, tar targets positions inside mainland Russia. Just imagine that, guys, if you're from the Russian side, whatever country you're in, you know, you know imagine now, your neighbouring country or a similar sort of thing. Imagine the imagine the perception from that country. Guys, this escalation is absolutely wild and it's gone relatively unnoticed because of this French election jazz. Um, and again, I'll come on to the French election after. Belgium, Denmark, Netherlands, Norway have committed to providing Ukraine with over 60 US-made F-16 fighters jets to help fend off Russian attacks. Ukrainian pilots are currently undergoing training to fly the warplanes ahead of deliveries expected to start later this year. Remember guys, right? it's not just flying them, it's the whole servicing. Sergei, Sergei, I'm not going to try and pronounce his second name, head of aviation within Ukrainian's Air Force said that a certain number of aircraft a certain number will be stored at secure air bases outside Ukraine so they are not targeted here. 
if they're if they're kept in another airbase, then that means they're not going either. Like like I said, guys, two reasons: they're either not going to be used, or they're going to be flown from that country. There isn't any other options. You can't just you know you can't have one at an airbase and then chuck another one in. At some point, you're going to have to fly those from somewhere. Guys, honestly, we are going to have. NATO aircraft flying from NATO countries attacking targets inside Russia. We're going to have that before the end of the year. Uh, this way we can always have a certain number of aircraft in the operational fleet that corresponds to the number of pilots we have, he said. If there are more pilots, there will be more aircraft in Ukraine. So what they're trying to say here is... Um, yeah, so what they're trying to say here is, you know, they're only going to bring the, the amount of aircraft into the country that they've got uh, pilots for. But the number of aircraft doesn't really matter because it's all about the airfield. If you've got, I don't know, 100 pilots and 120 aircraft, you know, spares, you know, on a runway or whatever, if that runway gets bombed and destroyed, guess what? Those aircraft are all useless because you can't fly them out of that aircraft. You have to truck them out or, or land move them out. So that's the reality. Now, this is just putting the, uh, you know, the tactical tiptoe. Oh, yeah, we're just keeping them in Poland just for safe storage. Oh, yeah, but the Polish F-16s are flying defensive sorties over Ukraine. No, that's a Polish F-16, not a Ukrainian F-16. You see how the waters are getting murky now. And, you know, this air war is only just beginning. So I think in response to this, the Russians have come out and they've said jets and airfields outside Ukraine could be legitimate targets, says a Russian lawmaker. So the Russians are now claiming that, you know, you're seeing this happen. Um, you're seeing this happen at a policy level first, at a government level, and then it will happen at a tactical level. So basically, F-16s and jet, I'm reading from the article now, guys. F-16s and military airfields outside Ukraine will become legitimate targets for Moscow if they take, take part in combat missions against Ukrainian, uh, Russian forces. Guys, I've been, like, probably, like, months ago I was saying this would happen, and it's happening now. You're starting to see it come out in the media. And then, you know, you know, this is the reality of the situation now, okay? And if you've not, and if you've not been following the channel, go check my, up my previous videos when I'm talking about this. When I'm talking about the, the F-16s are key, and that's going to be a key move forward. So... That's the main news for me, guys, all right? This, uh, you know, this France sna French snap election, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of just uh, a distraction. So that's the main one, guys, all right? You know, the F-16s are going to be kept in NATO countries. Well, outside Ukraine, that's what they're claiming from these articles. And the Russians are saying that they will attack the airfield if the Ukrainians start using them. Remember what we just said. How are the Russians going to know whether the Polish aircraft are setting off to do a defensive sortie or whether it's an F-16 setting off for an offensive sortie? Guys, absolutely wild times we're living in. So let's switch quickly to the France, French snap election. So what is he doing, Macron? What's he doing? So he's been up there, he's been saber rattling, he's been, you know, he's been starting a war and now he's doing a Sunak. Guys, you know, Sunak, Richie Sunak in the UK, he's, you know, he came out, well, he didn't come out. For those of you who watched this Andrew Bridgen interview, you know, he said, you know, Andrew Bridgen, who's a UK MP, he says that Richie Sunak does not want to be a wartime prime minister. We said it on here a couple of days later, there's a snap election. Oh, snap election. It's not, guys, this is all planned. So if we're looking at the timeline for this war being declared, July, August, maybe a little bit later, all this now fits into place and we can see where we're going because fresh fresh elections in France, you know, I don't know how the system works there, but it's usually four years. So that would mean whoever's in charge of France, whether it be Macron's back in charge or someone else, you know, they've got four years now without an election. And then after those four years, look what's happening in Ukraine. They're not doing elections. They've got, just got a uni party now, which is, you know, you could argue that's totalitarianism. But... If you believe that all these roads lead to World War Three, then you kind of see the breadcrumbs and you can understand why they're doing it now. So you've got the UK fresh election, France fresh election, United States fresh election. So the people who will be in power next, they can say, hey guys, listen, we didn't start this war, it's nothing to do with us. 
we, you know, we're the, you know, we're the ones who are having to follow it on. <clears throat> so in France, for example, whatever happens with the French troops going to Ukraine for the training mission, you know, the new party can say, hey, listen, you know, it wasn't anything to do with us. This is the old party. This is, you know, this is Macron's guy. You know, they, they, they did this. And if it's Macron who wins again, if it's the same party, that, sorry, if it's the same guys who, who are in power, then obviously they've got the mandate. They can say, hey, guys, you know, we, we've been very clear about this. This is our, our, um, our direction and you guys voted for us. So in that sense, it's, you know, it's a win win if you if you think that all these roads are going to, you know, lead into, um, you know, lead into Ukraine. So remember this fellowship guys of what was it france germany baltic states yeah the baltic states lithuania estonia and latvia and, and then the us came out as well saying that they could all use um you know their nato weapons to defend kharkiv uh, they could strike targets inside russia well guys none of this matters because the uk previously said which predates this that they don't it's up to the Ukrainians how they use British weapons. So, I, I mean, it was David Cameron who said this. So, all this um, jazz in the, you know, that people are talking about now by, you know, the US saying that they can use US weapons to defend Kharkiv. Well, a lot of the US weapons are made in the UK. You know, a lot of uh, the UK is the second largest defense manufacturer in the world. So, if we're saying that the UK can use, sorry, if they were saying that the Ukrainians can use British weapons anywhere, then these big headlines about the US letting Ukrainians use weapons to defend Kharkiv, it doesn't really matter because the, you know, the, the bridge has already been bridged. So, yeah, that's what basically David Cameron said. And I'll obviously put the links to this in the, um, you know, in the, um, in the description. So what we can see from the ground is the Ukrainians are now starting to really target Russian air assets. So a couple of weeks ago, you remember they targeted the long range um, intercontinental ballistic missile early warning radar. Well, obviously that radar system will have had other functions like being able to tell if an aircraft left in Poland, maybe. I don't know, guys, I'm just speculating. Um, but you would think that these systems have dual purpose and dual role, multi-role. So I'm kind of considering that all these things are leading to the Ukrainians flying their aircraft from NATO countries. So you've got the early warning radar that was taken out. You've got the other day, the Su-57 aircraft that was taken out. You've got, I think yesterday, the Ukrainians have started to target the S-500 systems. Now we don't know what these guys are using. And the reality is when, you know, we're never gonna know what these guys are using, but it wouldn't be, you know, it would be, it would be a good tactic to use the Western weapons, the NATO supplied weapons, you know, the, um, what are they called, uh, the scalp or the, um, what's the British variant of the scalp? Guys, put it in, put the link, put, put, somebody write it in the bio what it's called. Um, storm shadow, that's what it's called. The storm, the storm shadow or the scalp, these are big missile systems. They're about, they're over a ton, I think 1.3 ton. So, these systems have got the capacity to strike deep into, um, you know, deep into Russia, hit these targets, and then you can use further drones, smaller munitions, um, homemade drone, homemade in Ukraine, and they can just litter the area and make it look like it's a drone strike. The reality is we don't know what's really happening on the ground, and we'll probably never know what's happening on the ground. But you can pretty much guarantee now that from now on, the air war has begun. You're going to see more of these long range airstrikes taking out air defences, taking out um, communications, radar, early warning systems, other fighter jets while they're on the ground. Because, you know, NATO is really starting to um, ratchet up this air war in preparation for when the F-16s arrive and where they're going to be flown from, guys. Again, look at this from the Russian perspective. If you guys are in Russia now, you know, and you're seeing, remember, remember the perspective, right? The Russians don't believe the Ukrainians are, uh, are operating this. They believe it's Western troops. They believe it's NATO troops right on their door, firing weapons into Russia, taking out um, early warning systems. Imagine that if you're a Russian and somebody takes out your nuclear early warning system and it's all over the Russian media saying, oh, NATO's gonna do a nuclear, potentially do a nuclear strike. Why else would they take out our early warning system? 
If then they take out the S500 missile system, for those of you who don't know, the S500 is um, it's a, it's an air defence system. It's capable, well, they claim it's capable of taking out intercontinental ballistic missiles. So then the Ukrainians start a attacking those. Then they take out the Su-57, which is their, you know, air superiority fighter. So all this stuff, you know, the Russian population will be saying, Vladimir, use one of those nukes, use a tactical nuke, quick, save us, save us Vladimir, save us, quick, use a tactical nuke. And guys, once that happens, all bets are off, you know. I said this yesterday, imagine where, imagine the chaos in the UK if that happens. Imagine the chaos around the world if, you know, if the Russians start using um, nuclear weapons, battlefield nuclear weapons. And remember, this use of battlefield nuclear weapons, it's not a new thing. You know, if you, I'll put, I'll put a link in the bio. The U.S. had, um, you know, have the, have a whole tactical doctrine about this, about using battlefield tactical nuclear weapons and man maneuvers, how to, how to move, how to attack. You know, so it's, it's not a new concept. It's a really old concept. But if this starts to happen, you know, um, guys, imagine the chaos in the streets. It was only today I was in, um, I was in a supermarket with, uh, with Sarah. I was talking about the last time I was in this particular supermarket. Um, it was it was during I can't say because you get you get strange marks on your thing. Uh, it, it was it was it was it was a strange time in the last four years, and people were doing strange distancing. Let's let's just put it that way. And I remember being in there, and you had the Karen factor, and the Karen factor was huge because you you know you had these people who've been given a little bit of power and all of a sudden they're the experts on everything and then people are obeying them and you know it, it was absolutely wild I mean the story I the story I said I said there was um, down the road I said I, I used to go to that shop there and there was a guy he would wait outside the shop he would then tell people not to go in the shop he said right don't go in there yet don't go in there wait till everybody's out because I need to go in. And now this guy really believed, really be believed that he, he was at risk. You know, he had his mask, his gloves, his face mask on. And then when the last person came out, he'd clean the door handle. He'd go in and he got a newspaper. I was like, dude, if you're that scared, don't get a newspaper. Just check, check the headlines on your phone or whatever. You know, it's a lot safer. But anyway, what I'm trying to get to guys is people go crazy in these situations and it's not the it's not you guys that need to you know you guys don't need to worry about you guys you guys need to worry about the people who are not paying attention to what's happening in the world because they're the people who go bonkers they're the people who panic they're the people who worry they're the people who can't see objectively who can't think objectively sorry you know they can't see the wood because of the trees absolutely crazy and um, so the Baltic states, yeah. So the Baltic states also now are considering sending their own troops. The Baltic states and Poland are considering sending their own troops into Ukraine without NATO's, um, you know, without NATO's thumbs up. I said this, um, like one of my very early videos, I said Poland, actually. I said, look, you know, I think Poland could send troops into Ukraine by, you know, by say they're not part of NATO um, some other protection force or something doesn't really matter and at the moment guys things have progressed a lot a lot further so you've now got the Baltic states and Poland and I'll put a link to this in the video guys sorry I'll put a link to this video in the description just watch the first five seconds of this video you've got like uh, somebody from the Baltic states and like he says guys Russia are not gonna stop at Ukraine people need to wake up because these Baltic states and the Polish, you know, guys, the Polish remember how, you know, you've got Polish nanans and stories told about how Poland was under Russian occupation. It wasn't good. You know, they didn't like it and they don't want to go back to that. So they can remember these things. Us here in, us here in the, you know, in the West, we're kind of, um, you know, we're kind of blinkered to it. You know, we live on a fortress island if you live in the UK. And we have been, you know, we've been infested by students calling for socialism and calling for, you know, saying it's a good thing. I'd really like to send some of those people to go and live in Russia, to go and live under Russian rule. And the sense of, 
just how they operate, guys. Like, it's not good. You know, I don't want to go into socialism versus capitalism because, you know, it's, it's a long argument. Anyway, so the Baltic states basically are saying that they're, they're contemplating sending troops into Ukraine without NATO, without the NATO ticking the box or without, you know, they're contemplating going, going in on, the, on, on their own. So my questions would be why? Why now? And how much is this going to cost? Well, let's think why. Well, I've kind of just answered the why because they understand what this what's at risk, I feel. You know, they've got um, people in living memory who can remember what it was like to be under, I want to say rule. Yeah, Russian, R Russian Soviet rule, whichever way you want to call it. Why now? Well, I think it's all key and it all comes down to these F-16s and I've said this but for the longest time. Once they start flying these F-16s and striking targets proper inside Russia, and I mean striking them on a daily basis, on like guys, for those of you who remember the, um, the air campaign in Baghdad, sorry, in, in Iraq in 2003, the air campaign was absolutely colossal and that's how you kind of need to do something before you have a you know before you have a ground invasion you need to have an overwhelming air power now if this happens and they're going to be flying from poland if they're going to be flying from the baltic states they're going to be targets anyway see i've come back to my first point now they're going to be targets anyway so that would make absolute sense for them to commit fully at that point so that's why now that's why they're talking about it now i feel and how much is this going to cost so you've got to look at the cost versus benefit and, the, and that relationship this is going to cost a phenomenal amount of money for these countries involved you know, and they're not going to spend this money. They're not going to spend it lightly. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, governments tend to be reactive rather than proactive. So, and again, that's just the way the political class is set up. And it's, it's, um, it's terrible, all right? Politicians are reactive. So they wait for it. So they'll all turn their noses away and say, oh, it's not happening. It's not happening. It's not happening. No, ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. And then once it's critical and it's all, you know, and they have to do something, blah, 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 they're like, Right, why haven't you all been doing something? You guys should all be doing something. You need to, you know, they'll start flapping. They'll, sh anyway, that's how, that's how the political system works. So you've got to look at the cost involved with this. And wars are very expensive, guys. And I'm going to leave that. Yeah, guys, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to mag to grid. I'm going to go to the gym because my running machine's broke. And that's what I've got to do now. But I'll see you guys later.